Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Mike Reapy. I'm a member and past president of the UCSC Alumni Association and one of your volunteer organizers tonight. Welcome to our 57th edition of Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. For those who are new, our Slugs and Stein series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussions with you, the local community of the Monterey Bay and Silicon Valley, and our extended community online with a goal of making us all Renaissance people. We want it to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with a drink in your hand and without tests. David Hansen, another volunteer organizer, is with me tonight. We're both UCSC alumni and spend our working days in growing tech companies. He'll be helping me with the Q&A, and you'll hear more from him at the end. First, we would like to acknowledge and call attention to the fact that this morning at 8 a.m., postdoctoral scholars, academic researchers, and graduate student employees across all 10 UC campuses have begun a system-wide labor strike. We acknowledge the hard economic conditions faced by graduate students and postdocs and their valuable role in supporting UC's teaching and research mission, as well as the impacts that a strike can have on teaching, learning, and research. We encourage both sides to bargain in good faith, and we sincerely hope that a fair resolution to the strike is attained. We considered whether to cancel this evening's lecture, but our guest speaker insisted on taking this opportunity to bring the current strike to the attention of UC alumni and guests this evening. As you will see, Professor Carleet's research will address topics of labor. Information about campus operations on strike days will be posted at ucsc.edu status. And a good source for news coverage is, uh, is Lookout Local. It's, that's lookout.co slash Santa Cruz. Um, Diana just dropped those links into the chat if you'd uh, like to grab those. Before we get started, and since you can't, uh, we can't see you, we'd like to know where you're zooming in from and how many people are watching. Please take a moment to fill out a short poll that will pop up on your screen. We're sh we'll share the results uh, in a few moments. Okay, you should see the results pop up on your screen soon. Uh, and that'll give you an idea of who is in this virtual room along with you. Uh, we will be tipping our steins this evening with Associate Professor of Photography, Media and Film, Carolina Karlitz. Her work widely addresses the intersection of photography and documentary practices with a focus on systems of labor and industry, globalization, and their impact on the social and environmental landscapes. Professor Karlitz's portfolio includes rubber lands, a photographic and uh, uh, mapping of natural rubber manufacturing, and Unseen California, a hub for arts plus science plus humanities research. Carolina holds an MFA in photography and integrated media from the California Institute of the Arts and a BFA in photography from Minneapolis College of Art and Design. She received the 2011 John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship for creative arts and photography. We'll be addressing questions for Carolina at the end of the talk, but don't wait until the last minute. You can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time. If you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask it sooner. This talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post links to that in our social media channels and our follow-up emails. Okay, does everyone have their stein? Great, I've got your slug, Professor Carolina Karlitz. Thank you so much for having me this evening. I'd first like to thank the Alumni Association of UC Santa Cruz um, for, this, for this invitation to speak today um, and for acknowledging the current strike um, that is system-wide. Across ten of our all of our um, uh, UC campuses, where workers are calling uh, for better pay and benefits for teaching assistants, postdoctoral scholars, graduate student researchers, tutors, and fellows. As Mike mentioned, my research addresses the intersection of photography and documentary practices, with a focus on systems of labor and industry, 
globalization and their impact on the social and environmental landscapes. I'm going to start with work that is quite, oh, there we go, um, personal, um, more particularly uh, this photograph of myself and my mother, a passport photograph of uh, my immigration to the United States in 1987. English is my second language. My family moved from Poland in search of for a better life like many immigrants did and continue to do so. I grew up in and near the city of Detroit and had a pretty radical diverse upbringing. My first encounter with photography was due to a point and shoot camera that my family um, had purchased that my mother bought. My parents had a video camera later on that I would use often and that would become a tool for me um, to navigate a lot of the spaces that I was in. As a high school student, I studied photography, working in the dark room. And I remember I would stay late after school to print, to clean the lab and to talk about photographs with my high school photography teacher. This encouragement and access to be able to make photographic prints with my hands on uh, material planted a deep seed for me to further my relationship with the photography um, and my relationship to the medium of photography. As a student um, uh, in Minneapolis, I taught photography workshops at local nonprofits arts organizations. Here is um, some photographs that I made very early on um, making photographs of students that I was teaching. Uh, and I find the role of being a teacher one that has been the most fulfilling and rewarding in my entire career. I believe that arts programs are the cornerstones of broadly of a broadly rich education, and arguably the arts help level the learning field across socioeconomic boundaries by creating greater access for distinct voices and visions to command attention. The arts play a uniquely transformative role for youth and in developing unique forms of sharing historical backgrounds. I later then moved into photographing in color, which will become significant um, as I go into my talk and how I shift between using uh, the two different visual forms. Upon graduating, um, I was asked by this mentor uh, on the left here, her name is Catherine Turchon, artist professor, to assist her in work photographing abroad in Ukraine in the year 2005. Turchon's own artistic practice spans over 30 years. Her photographs explore portraits, family history, and political monuments in post-communist Ukraine. This modeling of a woman working in the field with a camera was incredibly formative for me at that time as a student. This experience in the field with my mentor would become a value that I share today with my students, which I will get to at the end of our talk. It also allowed, uh, it also led me to my first uh, solo exhibition, which is what is on the image on the right photographs that I made in Ukraine that I entitled Close to Home. In that series, I included these family archives. I started to think about where it was that I came from, where my family um, history resided, whether that be in the borders of what was Ukraine at the moment um, or Poland and these shifting borders and what it meant to be an immigrant. While I was in school, I created a thesis book that was about the deindustrialization of the city. The city of Detroit and the service communities surrounding the city that helped the auto boom, um, the auto industry industries, excuse me, the auto industry demands. For example, here's an image of uh, in 2002 of a outdoor worship site. Uh, that is most likely chairs that have been gathered from abandoned schools and buildings around the Detroit area. And I continued to photograph Detroit as someone who returned home quite often to visit my parents 
And I would revisit certain sites and photograph them year after year. This is 2004 and this is 2015. What I realized later on was that I left out photographs that I made on the outskirts of Detroit as a young student, photographs that I made in the suburbs. And I realized that these photographs at the time, I didn't know what they were symbols of or what they signified in relationship to the work that I was doing. But what I realized later on was that these were early signs of the financial crisis of the 2007, 2008, U.S. subprime mortgage crisis. You would see um, subdivisions, uh, pathways built in order to create uh, homes, but the homes would never uh, be built. Here you have a subdivision gate, uh, but no homes with stones blocking the entrances. So these markings of signs of the Great Recession were already happening in 2005, but we didn't know it. One could also relate them to uh, popular films such as The Big Short or Margin Call or Too Big to Fail. In 2007, I moved from Minneapolis where I was a student and I moved to Los Angeles to attend my graduate program at the California Institute of Arts. At that time, I was totally done working uh, about the decline of Detroit, making work about family, and I resisted making any type of autobiographical work with my research. I felt that I had already done it. Then I came across this New York Times image. The caption reads, praying for a miracle. SUVs sat on the altar of Greater Grace Temple, a Pentecostal church in Detroit, as congregants prayed to save the auto industry. What I realized here is that um, there was a crisis happening in Detroit and I was 3000 miles away. And I realized that uh, people here were trying to pray for the auto industry to be bailed out, looking for Obama to bail out the auto industry. What we also saw was popular media starting to tell the story of Detroit using photographic images and text um, and circulating specific narratives of Detroit. Here in 2009, Time Magazine had set out to create a year long assignment in Detroit. Inside, they, uh, inside this magazine cover of, uh, entitled The Tragedy of Detroit, it writes, this summer, the editors of Time Inc. did something a little out of the ordinary for us, or frankly, for anybody. We bought a house in Detroit. As houses go, it's nice enough. Three stories, five bedrooms, three and a half baths with a yard and a basement. We paid 99,000, about $80,000 above the average price of a house in the city limits. Then they ask, why would we ever do such a thing? And they write, because we, we believe that Detroit right now is a great American story. Notice the headline here. And notice the headline here. 20 years earlier, the same story, the same headline on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. So as I started to do visual research and think about the ways that narratives and the power of photography were to reveal a story of one that I cl was closely related to as an immigrant to Detroit, um, immigrating to Detroit, I thought, what was my story? And I began to think, how can I tell a new story or the proper story or the proper story from my perspective? So I started to think back on those photographs um, that were exhibited in my first solo exhibition family photographs, and I started to think about this narrative. And I started to look further into my family archives and the generations of mechanical engineers that were in my family. The fourth figure on the right-hand side um, with the dark hair is my grandfather. And this is him working in his uh, machine shop 
with his machine shop crew in Poland, in Wrocław, um, rebuilding the, the city after it had been bombed by the Nazis. Here are some other photographs of my grandfather working with machinery. And I started to think about ways in which I was presented my own media or my own ways of visual storytelling. This book here is a Polish primer. It is called an Elementarz. And this book is how Polish students learn the, the Polish language. It is similar to an alphabet book. And I started to look at the ways that world was presented to me as a young child through these illustrations, yet another form of images. The book did certainly uh, illustrate a certain type of life. It referenced communist, Eastern communist rule ideologies. Here you see an image of a family with two children pointing towards the factory. And the text translates to the factory here whistles or calls you in. So here is my grandfather, a mechanical engineer in Poland. And here is my father, a mechanical engineer in Detroit with the first IBM computer. So I decided to make my own version of this primer or elementash. Before I began to photograph, I recorded my conversations with my father from afar as he contemplated his own position in the auto industry and his own place within this economic recession. At that time, as an engineer, he had to decide if he would move back to Poland to sustain his career or take the chance of being laid off in Detroit as many were at that time. This layer becomes an installation. I'm gonna make sure that I have audio for you. I do, okay. Here, the book tracks four locations. The book becomes about reversals, reversals of an engineer looking for uh, work back in his homeland in Poland during the recession, uh, the great migration of Blacks and African Americans from the South moving to the Rust Belt for industry, moving back to the South, and my own reversal going back from Poland, Detroit, Mississippi, and California. This book becomes a conceptually driven narrative, and it's divided by chapters um, in which my father's texts to uh, emails and different communications with him, where in which he tries to attempt to sustain his family life and work life at the time of an unknown um, moment and between places of employment. So the book's theme is about capitalist dreams, economic and physical reversals. Here is uh, a clip in which I record various conversations with my father, contemplating if he will sustain his life in Detroit or if he's going to uh, go to Poland. Um, and I'm just gonna play a, a, a little clip of this. Uh, it ends up being a looping text, so there is no beginning and middle end. He goes between the Polish language and the English language. Um, there's static, which is intended from a uh, cell phone.
a text that my um, father wrote, which starts one of the chapters as his communication writes. It was a long time since we talked together. I missed you. I hope that as everything is okay with you and your project. I'm really, really busy here. Too many things, too less resources. Nevertheless, we all, we all here have very nice problem. We have too much work and customer orders. People are very nice. Everything looks here strange and gray. Life is simple for me, work and hotel. I miss badly my wife and my daughters. I'm hoping that I could get back to Detroit next Saturday. Original plan was to fly back tomorrow, but I have a lot of problems here with machinery here and I had to stay longer. I will try to call you tomorrow, stay in touch, father. So I follow my father's path as he does decide to go to Poland to facilitate the um, the opening of a, man, of an, a US manufacturing facility in the countryside of Poland. I follow him for um, his journey. He lives in Poland for three years and is back and forth between uh, the US and Poland. Here's uh, the West End of the factory that does end up being chosen to be transitioned into an American manufacturing facility. I also started to photograph um, everyday life of workers and um, the domesticated factory space. Here is a lunch table. I photographed family um, and thought about my position within this narrative of the recession, but also what it meant to uh, come from a lineage of Polish women. Here is my mother, my grandmother. My father traveled uh, to visit me in, in Los Angeles at the time as well. Michael Jackson became a marker of uh, a marker of time as he passes away. In, uh, in the news here in Poland. And then this photograph at Motown Records in Detroit of uh, MJ's memorial. The automobile becomes a theme, of course. On the right-hand side is a version of my, uh, my own Belle Isle photograph. And on the left-hand side is a well-known image by the photographer, Robert Frank, who also started his, um, well, he started his work photographing for a Guggenheim Fellowship in the factories of Detroit and looking at the automobile workers um, in the 50s. I just go through, the book ends up having um, 75 photographs. And I've just selected some here for you. I traveled all across the country looking at signs of the economic collapse, specifically through the automobile industry. I visited um, auto museums. For example, here is a Montana auto museum. And I thought of this as the graveyard for a vehicle. The vehicle can no longer go. Um, it doesn't do what it's intended to do. I also went to Mississippi uh, with close family that I grew up with um, in Detroit to uh, have a celebration of life for the uh, maternal matriarch of the family um, and return her to her land of Mississippi. Here is images from the celebration of life, the mother, the brother and the father. What I noticed most vividly in this work was dealerships closing all across the country. Um, and what you would see are these canvas coverings on top of the uh, signs for the, uh, for the dealerships. For me, they looked like um, white surrender flags all over the landscape. That work in this book led to, and previous work, um, as I'm just ha have a selection here for us this evening, led to uh, my application for a Guggenheim Fellowship 
and it allowed me to engage in my next body of work. The next body of work that I'll share with you is one called Rubberlands, in which I propose that photography and rubber are integral key components of the second industrial revolution. They are also key components for colonialism and globalization. Henry Ford's invention of the automobile is one of the most significant inventions of the second industrial revolution. I will uh, be talking about work that happens in Detroit, Michigan at the Henry Ford Benson Research Center, which are the Henry Ford Company archives, research that is performed at the University of Akron, Ohio, in the company archives of Goodyear, Goodrich, General Tire, Firestone, and field research that is done in Para, Amazonia, Brazil, and field research that, that is done in Bahia, the Atlantic Forests of Brazil. In 1927, Ford wanted his own supply of rubber, and he decided to get it by carving out a plantation in a miniature Midwest factory town out of the Amazonian jungle, in which he called Fordlandia. Um, here I have a timeline of Henry Ford's impact on all of us. Um, the Ford Motor Company starts in the early 1900s. Moving forward, 1914, he begins uh, offering $5 per day, which changed the entire um, labor system. And in 1928 to 1945, he creates this company, Town Fordlandia, in which I was incredibly inspired by um, because if you notice, 1928 to 1945 is a time of the Great Depression and not a time of economic boom. Um, rubber comes from a tree that originates in the Amazonian region, the Havea. In 1839, Charles Goodyear improved this process called balkanization, which modified rubber so that it would support extreme temperatures. People started to realize that rubber had outstanding economic potential. It was then that natural rubber became sustainable for producing hoses, tires, industrial bands, sheets, shoes, shoe soles, and various many other products. What initially caused the beginning of the rubber boom in Brazil, however, was the popularization of the bicycle. The boom would then be accentuated after 1900 by the development of the automobile industry and the expansion of the tire industry to produce car tires. The early uses of material were quite limited. Initially, the problem of natural rubber was that it was too sensitive to temperature changes, which altered its shape and consistency. Plantation rubber would be imported to a place in Akron, Ohio, where all of the um, tire manufacturers produced um, the need for the automobile industry. But to go back to this rubber boom, the rubber boom from 19, 1879 to 1912 was an important part of the economic and social history of Brazil and the Amazonian regions of neighboring countries, which related to this extraction and com commercialization of the rubber. Centered in the Amazon basin, the boom resulted in a large expansion of European colonialism in the area, attracting immigrant workers, generating wealth, causing cultural and social transformations, and wreaking havoc upon indigenous societies. It encouraged growth of cities such as Manaus, Porto Viejo, Belém, Santares, capitals within the respective Brazilian states of Amazonia. Natural rubber was first used by the indigenous peoples of, Amaz of the Amazonian basin for a variety of purposes. And by the middle of the 18th century, Europeans had began to experiment with rubber as a waterproofing agent. This is where I did most of my research, um, which is in Akron, Ohio, in the archives of uh, the uh, rubber manufacturing uh, Firestone, uh, Goodyear, Goodrich, et cetera, that I had just mentioned. Akron, Ohio was the rubber manufacturing center for the world. 
I found photographs, um, again, looking at how rubber was uh, manufactured, but also how it was advertised. All the company archives um, show also factory workers processing this rubber that is plantation rubber in Akron, Ohio. Um, Hollywood actresses would come and uh, promote the advertising and selling of the material, uh, shoes. But I want to take us to uh, the pink river that's highlighted, the Tapajos River. That is where the uh, Henry Ford built Fordlandia. Um, I spent some time there, but not the majority. The majority of my research is on the right hand side at the red dot, which is in the Atlantic forest where Firestone had um, deforested some of the largest uh, Atlantic forest sites ever. And I will talk a bit about um, what I did there. I found that there were there was an amazing photographic history to trace in these company archives. Some that talk about art history, photographic history, here these images reference pictorialism. But I also found that there was a, a, an interest for me in thinking about the archives of who had access to document this, uh, this moment in time. Also remembering that photography is not widely circulated. So a lot of the images that were created and that I researched were because people had access to a photographic camera and film. And most of those people were researchers, um, soil researchers, environmental researchers that uh, were working with companies in order to uh, help the production of the automobile uh, tire. This image, for example, is um, Ford Motor Company ends up buying these millions of acres of land in Brazil. They loaded boats with machinery and supplies and shipped them deep into the Amazon rainforest. Workers cut down trees and cleared the land, and then they built a rubber plantation in the middle, in the middle of one of the wildest places on earth. It was initially estimated that when the plantation was under full cultivation, it would produce enough rubber to make tires for 2 million automobiles a year. Henry Ford didn't just want to be a maker of cars, he wanted to be a maker of men. He thought he could perfect society by building model factories and pristine villages to go with them. He was pre pretty successful at already doing this in Michigan, but in the jungles and the Amazon of Brazil, he would ultimately be defeated. It was in 1927 where he wanted to supply his own rubber. He decided to get it by carving out this plantation in a miniature Midwest factory town called Fordlandia. The land was hilly, rocky, and fertile. None of Ford's managers had the proper knowledge of tropical agriculture. The rubber trees were packed closely together in plantations as opposed to widely spaced in the jungle. They were easy for prey and leaf blight, lace bugs, red spiders and leaf caterpillars, a problem that was absent from what is now a rubber producer in the Asian rubber plantations, where the uh, manufacturing of rubber was transplanted uh, due to a explorer whose name is Henry Wickham, who had stolen 70,000 seeds from the Amazon and um, sold them to uh, the British. The mostly indigenous workers on the plantations were given unfamiliar foods such as hamburgers and forced to live in American style housing, disliked the way that they were treated. They had to wear ID badges and work through the middle of the day under the tropical sun. Henry Ford also brought plumbing um, to the Amazon the key to the plantation was cultivating the rubber tree. Unlike the early rubber boom, which relied on sarangueros or indigenous rubber gatherers that collected wild latex. Despite repeated invitations from residents and periodic promises to do so, Henry Ford never actually visited the, the, his jungle city. This is a photograph um, of some of the only color slides that existed that I found in the 
archives in the basement of the University of Akron, Ohio. And this is one of the manager's houses because the managers in Ferlandia were separated from the workers. Some of the photographic considerations that I took in, um, in approaching making my own work and my own field research was thinking again about who had access to color slide film, um, what types of cameras did people have, what was the intention of people um, photographing and sending images, photographic images and journals back to uh, the United States from Brazil uh, to report progress on the plantation. Um, here we have a, let's see, uh, this photograph was made by Cortland Man B. Manifold, who was a soil specialist who worked for the United States government, as well as Goodyear and Firestone. He, for example, investigated land in South America, West Africa, and Far East for planting rubber during the first half of the 20th century. I started to also research the ways that narratives were told about the Amazon or the ways that we have exotified um, the, the ideas of the other, um, more specifically in uh, the jungle. Fitzcarraldo is a 1982 West German uh, surreal adventure drama film written and directed by Werner Herzog, who some of us might be familiar with. And it stars Klaus Kinski as the title character. It portrays what would be a rubber baron, Brian Sweeney Fitzgerald, an Irishman known in Peru as Fitzcarraldo, who is determined to transport a steamship over a steep hill in order to access rich rubber territory in the Amazon basin. The film is derived from the historic events of Peruvian rubber baron Carlos Fitzcarraldo. I'm including a clip here of a documentary of the making of Fitzcarraldo's film um, in which Werner Herzog uh, is speaking to the camera. Herzog is stranded in the jungle with a 300 ton steamship that won't move and time is running out. He needs money to move the ship but no one will invest unless the ship moves first. Behind his back, some of the actors are talking about getting out while the getting is good. Only a few of the cast, crew, and Indians believe in his dream anymore. Even Herzog is beginning to wonder. Of course, we are challenging nature itself, and it hits back. It just hits back, that's all, and that's grandiose about it, and we have to, to accept that it is much stronger than we are. Kinski always says it's full of erotic elements. I don't see it so much erotic, I see it more full of obscenity. It's just, and nature here is vile and base. I wouldn't see anything erotical here. I would see fornication and asphyxiation and choking and fighting for survival and growing and just rotting away. Of course, there's a lot of misery, but it is the same misery that is all around us. The trees here are in misery and the birds are in misery. I don't think they, they sing, they just screech in pain. So, Werner Herzog is completely playing into this exaggerated notion that um, the audience is perceived to have about this wild, wild space. Um, and I found that really interesting that he was already doing this in, in 1982. I started to also then research the ways in which color photography about nature um, had entered spaces of, um, popular media versus art. Um, Elliot Porter made these vivid images of landscapes and birds, but during that time, his photographs were uh, remarkable for their subtlety and vibrancy, but they were considered too, um, too close to reality to be considered art, which I found really interesting. That's Elliot Porter with this 
amazing setup uh, with a film camera and all of these strobes in order to photograph these birds' nests. He, uh, as I mentioned, was considered too literal uh, with his work, but I feel he's one of the um, more under uh, underrepresented and misunderstood artists because people really saw them, mostly artists, the art world saw them as simply photographs of nature. Um, here's a photograph by a photographer who created these quite large um, Thomas Struth, the artist, creates these quite large prints, um, almost one-to-one -one life size. And so you engage with this tropical green landscape. And I thought, well, if, um, if we're in a space where uh, we're using vibrancy of the color of the jungle, what does that tell us more about the jungle? We're in a space culturally in the 21st century where we're sharing images on our Instagrams, on our phones, we're transmitting all of these color digital images. And I had been incredibly inspired by this film by Alexander Payne um, called Nebraska. And I was so impressed by his ability to use black and white in this moving picture, which depicted the interiors uh, living rooms of the middle of America, families of Billings, Montana. Um, like we know the plaid shirts. We know what color the, that is. We know the doily. We know the texture of the wall is brown. Um, and I thought that I wanted to challenge myself in the way that I would photograph again, going back to that very first image of photographing my students um, and photographing in monotone, photographing in black and white, and thinking about ways that light could re light as a messaging system could uh, engage with the images that I would make. So I was inspired by Henry Ford and Fordlandia, but I didn't want to make the work about Fordlandia. Um, I didn't want it to be similar to the ruin photography that was being made in uh, Detroit. Uh, that I rejected. And also I didn't want it to be a what was what, or what what was once there um, uh, and focusing on Henry Ford. So I expanded my work, um, which is then on a current rubber plantation site. It's a reforestation site that's owned by Michelin. Um, and I wanted to address rubber as a commodity and photography in the same project. So I started with sharing my work while I was working in the field. And I found it incredibly important as an educator um, also to connect with people and the places um, that I work in. I worked at the Michelin Ecological Reserve uh, that was created in order to preserve a significant portion of the Southern Bayan Atlantic rainforest. It's also known for its rich biodiversity endemic species in a region that was suffered widespread deforestation and forest degradation. While protecting the forest from illegal hunting and wood cutting was the fundamental purpose of creating this reserve in which I worked on, Michelin seized the, also the opportunity to invest in reforestation, ecological research, and environmental education programs. Here, um, students are looking at my work um, on the laptop. So the next body of work, which I'll go through quickly, is called Rubberlands, but it's not an actual place on a map. It's rather a place for critical conversation, for looking, and for reflection. Here are some installation images from um, New York for a uh, the exhibition. I spent most of my time photographing um, this family, the Fadias family. This is the eldest daughter. And I became very close with, uh, with them in particular because I felt that there was some sort of connection. This is a family who lives on the rubber plantation at Michelin. Their father works on the plantation. And I started to relate what it meant for me to grow up in a world of industry um, in the Midwest, in the US, and what it meant for uh, this family and these young girls to grow up in a land of industry and labor in a completely um, 
different environment than the one that I had grown up in. Here's a little clip of uh, some the still from a film called The Romance of Rubber. I also looked back at the archives and created um, some of my own images that referenced the archives. Here's a rubber tree being grafted in a contemporary context. This was a grafted tree from um, the 50s. I also photographed everyday life on the plantation, um, playing soccer, lunch break room for the plantation managers. I also photographed labor that was occurring outside of the rubber manufacturing. The painting on the left is one of the first paintings that represents urban working class people whereas peasants or country workers had often been shown, city workers had seldom been painted. I included this because um, I didn't know that in the back of my file cabinet that I was referencing this painting um, in my photograph on the right-hand side, but sometimes those things come forward. I started to think about our relationship to nature, place, home, land, ownership, belonging in a world of production, extraction, and consumption. Here is a housing uh, project uh, that was started by the Brazilian government. For me, it very much referenced the idea of a plantation, which is uh, intended to be um, efficient. Here are some photographs of uh, Fordlandia, the bicycle, and some of the homes that Henry Ford built, which I photographed with a much smaller camera, uh, a, a fast point and shoot, and I also include those. So I'm going to wrap with introducing um, my current work, uh, which is called Unseen California. Uh, this work is new. It is uh, in progress at the moment, and I'm really excited to, uh, to be sharing it with you all today. Unseen California is curated from, uh, it's an arts research initiative, which is curated from a range of cultural producers. It invites us to learn about ways in which the arts can play an urgent role in addressing issues of access, equality, social, and environmental justice. I launched Unseen California in 2021 and intended to be a 10-year program with multiple facets. These include immersive arts field research across the UC Natural Reserves by cohorts of professional artists, teaching, and engagement with the public. In order to build this new initiative over the next nine years and to support undergraduate and graduate students, Unseen California is seeking donors, so please spread the word. The educational component of Unseen California builds on the long history of UCSD arts faculty fostering community dialogues about the environment. This includes decades long effort by art professor Norman Locke who is now retired, to expose students to the natural reserves. I continue to bring students, undergraduates and MFA students from the art department's new MFA program in environmental art and social practice to reserves to discover the value of field work and immersive learning. 
Once in the field, students have opportunities to collect data, participate in field work, and learn about topics such as land, climate change, ecology, et cetera. These firsthand experiences allow students to get immersed in new subjects, which then influence their entire academic art research career. The first cohort of artists that I invited to join me are a group of five women photographers that are coming from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, Dion Lee, Mercedes Dorami, Tara Kranyak, and Aspen Mays. I'm going to share what we're doing in our first year working across the reserves. Um, there are 41 UC natural reserve sites that are locations stewarded by the University of California, most typically used for scientific research, not as sites for art making, pedagogy, and social activism. The residencies last um, for a lengthy two years. I've invited these artists to engage in any site that they wanted to that related to their work that they were already doing. Um, they are artists that are engaged with topics of land and um, and I wanted to create a research cohort in which the artists could go multiple times, revisit a site over different seasons, and also for them to have time to reflect on their experiences working with a specific site and to deepen their relationship with place and community, which is not similar, which is not typical, excuse me, for an artist in residency. Collaborating across these various UC reserves, uh, all these artists are set out to create their own artworks to reframe California's cultural histories and each ecological landscapes beyond what have been these canonical uh, art perspectives. Artist Tara Kranyak, for example, is working in Big Sur at a site called Big Creek. She has taken inspiration from a speech that photographer Ansel Adams delivered at the reserve's dedication ceremony in 1978. Kryak has studied the recording of Adams' speech and recorded herself performing a progressively more redacted version, showcasing the problematic aspects of modern photography's canons via acts of erasure, redaction, and reenactment. Here are some of her um, photographic prints. Mercedes Dormi, a Tongva artist herself, has chosen to work at Santa Cruz Island Reserve part of the Channel Islands, while also working at Catalina, Catalina Island, in part because her ancestors inhabited what is now the Los Angeles Basin. Her study includes contrasting the feeling of safety and shelter on the virtually uninhibited Santa Cruz Island with the developed Catalina Island. Artist Aspen Mays is investigating the lives of acorn woodpeckers whose behaviors and interactions with oak trees have been studied at the reserve for more than 50 years. Mays is collaborating with the Citrus Initiative for Drone Education and Research, which you see on the left-hand side, uh, they're flying a drone here, 3D scanning the tree, which we see a clip of in the center. And then there's a close-up of the grainy of the, of the woodpecker granary on the right-hand side. Dion Lee at Steel Ranch Desert Research Center, a site for anthropological excavations. Artist Dion Lee is examining wilderness survival skills as a metaphor for grappling with harmful and historical structures and acknowledging survival as an active attempt made every day. Myself, I'm working with multiple forms of visual sensors, focusing on erosion of the California coastline and um, here we have an image on the left-hand side of Big Sur, Big Creek post Dolan fire. And on the right-hand side, we have a two years post the fire. Right after the fire, I had installed uh, trail cameras in areas where the land uh, had gulges or there would be uh, rainfall after the winter rain came and the lands the land would slide into creating movement uh, and trigger the camera's sensors. I'm also working at uh, coastal sites 
uh, inspired by the bottom left hand side's fog data collector, which is a, a scientific tool by uh, Professor Peter Weiss, where water falls on the mesh and then um, is collected into uh, the uh, collecting jar below. And uh, we get a sense of how much fog is in the air at different locations. I was very much inspired by these uh, instruments and created my own, um, which is a visual fog data collector uh, made out of copper um, and installed at various locations and elevations at uh, different coastal sites across California. I'm very much interested in the fog line as the horizon line and photography, thinking about what is above and below the fog line. Here's some images of the copper plates installed at various locations. Uh, what will happen to the copper plates is a uh, visual alchemy, uh, one that will show us at different elevations what the impact of this collaboration with the fog uh, will do. Another thing that um, I want to point that this research cohort is working with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. In our goal to create a new archive that is representative of contemporary thinkers, we are engaging beyond the UC, uh, working here with uh, Shana Lopes, who is the assistant curator of photography from the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which holds the world's largest Western landscape photography collection some of the images. The other um, uh, research endeavor that we're embarking on is producing a documentary film that will serve as an accessible archive for all of the works produced by these research cohorts. This will serve as an educational tool. It will also create opportunities for the general public to witness the creative process of interdisciplinary artistic practice. I'm going to play a clip um, of work in progress of Tara Krangak working in the field. I was already working on a project called Master Rituals, and it's engaged with the history of landscape photography in the West, and I was particularly interested in Ansel Adams and Edward Weston, and I wanted a site that was closely related, and I found this, um, I found that Ansel Adams gave the inaugural speech to this reserve that we're on right now. So. I found the speech, I found a copy of it and um, in special collections. And um, it's really, it, it's actually, um, it, it talks about the future of this site. Um, kind of thinking about how that speech um, contemplates a future which we are now in, but also post the Dolan fire. So I thought that this was a particularly, like it was 2021 when we started. So 2020 was when the fire um, kind of destroyed a lot of the, the um, redwoods and the trails. And I really wanted to examine how the landscape changed post fire, but I also wanted to use this text um, to reperform the, the speech or the text in amidst the the aftermath of the fire. And I tried it and I was like, I think this is the wrong place for this text. Like I'm gonna take it outside and maybe that's gonna be later. And I just kind of responded to my surroundings and let myself kind of make weird, well, you know, I don't think of myself as a landscape photographer. And um, 
as I was, I was learning how to see with my tools. You know, I was learning how the camera sees in the forest, which I've never done. And I thought it was really fascinating. Like I thought it was the limits of the camera and also my body's relationship to muscle memory and you know, working with an 8x10 in the studio is very different than like hiking with an 8x10. Eventually I came to this idea that like I need to, I, I, I need to go down in format, I need to be more mobile, I need the camera to be more of an extension of my body and you know, how, would, how do I see when I can shoot fast and not think about it? Like, and yeah, I started looking down. Mm -hmm. I started looking at what was beneath my feet and all of the tiny things that were growing beneath. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, that was uh, very personal and, and, and inspiring. Thank you very much. So now is the time to enter your questions uh, in the bottom uh, under the Q&A section. Uh, I'm going to slide in my own first one. Uh, I spent the weekend up uh, driving between Santa Cruz and Half Moon Bay and observing actually for the first time that fire and the results of it. Uh, you have been uh, studying this intensely. I'm kind of wondering uh, what your big picture impression is as you uh, as you look at it as a as a keen observer. Uh, mm -hmm. What's it? What's do you have any images? Any any sort of moments that come to you that that reflect the future for that area? Well, I think that's in some ways what Tara is touching on in this clip, that, that, that there is a resiliency to the land. Um, and as humans, we believe we have uh, new knowledge of how to maintain an, uh, an ecological site or a space. And perhaps we have more knowledge about ways that spaces were uh, maintained by indigenous communities way before, um, you know, the present time. But I do think that there, there is a new response to fire in particular, and it's not about um, resisting the fire or fire prevention, but it's about adapting to the reality of our futures, which are incredibly impacted by climate change. And I think the arts in particular um, are ways in which we can look at problem solving for California that, um, you know, the conversations that I'm having interdisciplinarily with researchers uh, and scientists, it, it's, it's the more we come together, I think the more we actually can see certain futures. Thank you, uh, Carolina. Thanks, David. Um, another reminder uh, for our audience, if you can uh, have any questions for Carolina, you can type them in the Q&A box at any time. I think I, I have a few questions myself. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious, like, I think a lot of us don't understand the, the different modalities of, of being a practicing photographer, right? You, you move back and forth between fine art photography, between uh, documentarian, between journalist, and, and also educator. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how you how you move back and forth between those modalities and or, over the course of your career. Yes, that's a that's a uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I think that we don't we all sort of fall in love with the thing we do and then we fall out of love with, with it. And I think there are, there are ways that um, we should look at the thing that we do from all angles you know what is the what is the impact of um everyday looking at photographs what is the impact of photographs sitting in a box in the middle of akron ohio that no one's picked up or engaged with or uh what does it mean to be a cinematographer and produce a film and uh, what does it mean to be installing photographic cameras that don't have an author per se 
but the land is the author and the sensor is the trigger. Um, I'm, I'm really asking all of those questions myself. Excellent. Uh, you use the term uh, images have power, I believe. I'm, I'm paraphrasing you. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, both positive and negative. If you think back uh, and think of powerful images that you became aware of perhaps early, which ones in your mind were, or which one or two had huge positive influence it's told mm -hmm. a story that was impactful in a positive way and which do you think maybe steered in a negative had a negative power to it that that you remember oh wow um early photographs that were in the 1930s by james van der Zee, which is a photographer that photographed in the harlem renaissance um, those photographic images, I remember revealing this uh, middle class of Harlem to a wider world. And I remember thinking, wow, these are really beautifully powerful images. Um, there were also um, very poignant images by Gordon Parks that I, that I as a young student, um, he has a book called uh, The Choice of Weapons, which I suggest to my students, in which uh, he was a farm security administration photographer, a black photographer who photographed also for Life magazine. And he was in this, uh, this position of uh, talking about racism within the United States and also uh, being on a platform for Life magazine. Um, and so the book, The Choice of Weapons, is really thinking about the ways that the camera does have this power. Um, I see a lot of images ex that are exploitative. Um, and I don't, I mean, there's so many of them, I don't know that I would be able to pinpoint one exactly um, that is negative, but we see them every day. Um, now. Maybe I'll, I'll take the chance to ask another question of mine. Um, you know, as a uh, as a researcher and a professor, right at a, at a research university, um, clearly your your work has a big uh, research component. Um, but I, I'm curious about uh, your teaching practice, right? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. how students how, how students learn about this field, and and maybe some of the stories of some of the students you've you've worked with. Yeah. Oh, the students are so great. Um, you know, I, I really I came to uh, UC Santa Cruz from UC San Diego um, in 2016. And I, at that time, wasn't aware of this resource of the uh, UC Natural Reserves. And I didn't realize the, the expanse of it as the largest uh, field station uh, uh, research system in the entire world. And a lot of our students don't know about it and especially art students. It's typically environmental studies students that are um, exposed to this as a resource. And I bring this up because uh, my work is out in the field. It is, it is very much um, outside of the studio. If it is in the studio, it's more of a organizing stage. And so my teaching is very much about taking students out into the world and thinking about what it means to experience space, um, what it means to research archives, uh, how can you be immersed in arts field research and what does that mean, social responsibility. So my teaching is um, in the archives, uh, moving image, it, arts field research, photography plays an environment, uh, social engagement, and art and pedagogy. Um, what is what is a site? So it, it pretty much ranges.
So Michael has a question. Thank you for sharing your practice with us this evening. You've demonstrated a lot of growth as an artist and a photographer, whereas some artists replicate an approach throughout their careers. You've grown and changed your approaches. What has helped you grow as an artist? And when you get stuck, how do you get unstuck? That's a great question. Thank you, Michael. Oh. I think this idea that I fall in love with chance, um, similarly to, I, I more recently someone asked a similar, a similar question, not, not necessarily in the same context, but they asked, well, why do you do it? You know, like what if, <laughs> and the reward is the chance for me. So I think if I'm not, um, shifting or challenging myself as an artist and thinking about how I practice in the con in a contemporary time and space, then I don't know that my impact is a true or the work that I'm producing is a true reflection of the time that we're in. Um, and it is just a remodeling of a methodology that somehow I have found works. And I think a lot of artists do this. Um, I've never been interested in that. That doesn't feel genuine to me. So when I feel stuck, I make copper sheets into fog data collectors and <laughs> you know, try different try different things. Um, I, I, I'm constantly questioning what my role as a photographer is and what the role of the photographic image is. And and thinking about what parameters I've set for myself. Um, and, and I think the parameters thing is what gets me unstuck is to either think of the parameters of research as very narrow, going from really micro to macro and going in and out. Um, and that seems to help me to have a little play and freedom and allow for some chance uh, to happen. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, another, another question of my own. You'll, if you forgive the, you know, the question, I'm a, I'm a tech guy and also, a, you know, a photography hobbyist. Um, if you can, you know, as as, a, as an artist, you have to have a you have to have an eye for the material, but also a, a you know firm mastery of your medium. And I'm curious, like, tell us a little bit about this beautiful picture behind you and about the equipment you use and how you you know how you manipulate that equipment. Yeah, sure. So the majority of the work that I've shown has been um, made on a large format field camera that has a ground glass, uh, meaning that you're looking through, you're, you're uh, hiding the light from looking through the ground glass, you're wearing some sort of a, a cape of sorts, um, and you're seeing the world through a camera obscura, through a pinhole, and the image is inverted. And I found that that camera for me slows me down quite a bit. Um, the image behind me is made in, in part with the Rubberlands research. It's a, a rubber tree grove. And uh, some of the work is uh, eight by 10 inch. So the negative is um, not 35 millimeter, but four by five or eight by 10. And that allows me to um, have more detail when I print larger so the images like the one above here is about 60 inches um when it is printed and so this allows uh allows me to print that large but i also am very interested in small work at the moment um and different film stocks are also chosen uh for example ectochrome was a uh positive film that I used for the early color work because that's what the advertisers used. Um, so I'm also mimicking their methods or looking at their methods specifically and trying to place myself within that. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so your, your, your talk, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go between seeing uh, California. Uh, and it falls into uh, a number of talks that we've actually had in Slugs and Steins that have to do with the natural reserve. So I appreciate that. Uh, 
Uh, it also, uh, it's something because it has to do with so many different sides of UCSC, highlights the fact that this uh, integration across the various disciplines is possible within such a theme. So I'm wondering, where do you get inspiration? What other departments do you especially get inspiration from? Are there specific projects uh, mm. that you either have or would like to see? I'm really an anthropologist at heart. Um, I am incredibly inspired by not just humanities, but uh, the ways that anthropology has changed and is changing as a medium, um, as a medium of study, meaning that it's not as siloed as it used to be. Um, and that's really interesting for me. And I think that that's happening across uh, a lot of our areas within the institution and within research in, um, in general. Um, history, world history, of course. Um, I'm very much inspired by students, really. Um, I, you know, every week I'm like, oh, I, I, I'm out now, I'm now at the uh, the timeline of teaching where certain students remind you of a past student, and you get reminded of um, you know things that happened ten years ago, and and I'm I'm really loving this this cycle because I'm able to think about things differently now as I'm aging. And so there's this sort of um, revisiting that I get to do. And oh yeah, teaching is the most inspiring. Well, wonderful. I think uh, before we run out of time, I'll just ask, uh, um, you know, what's next for you? Uh, I'm sure you're, you're engrossed and immersed in your current project, but you have some unfinished business, some, some dreams. I really am the spearheading this new Unseen California initiative. Um, we would love to, you know, well, we're, we would love to find find donors and sponsors to be able to continue that in a way that it deserves. But we do have an upcoming exhibition of this first research cohort at the Penumbra Foundation, which is a New York uh, City foundation and that will be next year in 2023 October um, and we'll also be launching a field notes publication that will, will accompany um, that exhibition so it we're calling it field notes because it's a work in progress exhibition of what we've all been doing so that's what's on the horizon um, in one year thank you okay. so much for having me no, oh, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, please give me and an applause for uh, Professor Karlitz. Uh, thank you, Carolina, for uh, you. sharing your research with us. Now, the talk has been recorded and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days. So I'd also like to extend our thanks to the staff of alumni relations and university events. Diana is with us today, but in the background on other times has been Shayna, Polina, and Kristen. And I also want to give a shout out to April, April Yi, who is a co-organizer of Slugs and Steins. So our next Slugs and Steins will be Monday evening, December 12th, and will feature Professor of Linguistics, Pranav Anand. Pranav has focused his research on online discourse and how computers can aid in dissecting such discourse. His work elucidates how context alters the meaning of linguistic expressions, including expressions of effect, belief, perspective, and quantity. Might there be some relevant insights to the current Twitter chaos? Tune in to see. Well, meanwhile, the holiday season can be a good time to tour the UCSC Arboretum. Between the 17th of November and December 22nd, a number of birds and blooms tours 
of this lovely campus corner are being conducted. Event, again, go to events.ucsc.edu to register. So on behalf of the UC, so oh, I forgot to mention, we do also have a, a crawl lecture coming up. I don't have the data in front of me, but that was shown in the beginning. Look it up also on the events calendar. It should be exciting from the genomics work where of course UCSC has had a focus. On behalf of UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us and please come back on December 12th at 6.30 p.m for our next virtual event.